if you will, open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, and I'll read uh, verses 24 through 27 here in just a moment. Again, uh, the Old Testament prophet Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Uh, it is uh, occasions uh, like today after I've had a, another couple of weeks of uh, forced absence that I realize what a privilege it is to stand before God's people and proclaim God's Word, and that we should never uh, take uh, any of the great uh, pleasures and privileges and joys of life uh, for granted. Uh, I am uh, doing well. Uh, I, I had uh, the stupid idea that I was just going to walk out of the hospital jumping rope, and it hasn't worked quite that way, but uh, I am doing well and thankfully have not had any really major setbacks. Uh, it's one of those things that uh, just takes time. So I'm on my way. All right. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's my educated <coughs> guess that Daniel is the most well-known of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, there's two primary reasons for this. First, the author and the title characters, faithfulness, courage, and boldness, while living in the royal courts of Babylon and Persia, are rightfully the staples of children's Bible stories. These stories remind believers that even in difficult times, God is always faithful, and that He calls His people to faithful living, even in dire circumstances. The second reason that the book of Daniel is so well known is that it, it seems at least to be the favored go-to of the Old Testament prophecies for those who attempt to relate current events, political leaders, and conflicts with certain predictions found in Daniel and other books of the Bible. This type of instruction and speculation was propelled by the popularity of a book by Hal Lindsey, published in 1970, entitled The Late Great Planet Earth. Over the last 50 years, there have been literally dozens, if not hundreds of books, including both nonfiction and fiction treatments of the various prophetic passages in the Bible. There have been even a number of movies made based on these books and these passages. Some of the book series actually lasted longer than the tribulation, and I think the authors got richer than the Antichrist will, but that's probably another subject for another day. The sermons, interviews, and books of the previously mentioned Lindsay, along with contributions of some of the most popular pastors, commentators, and scholars of the 20 and 21st centuries, have populated the airwaves, and the bestseller lists from the 70s until today. Even now, with general international anxieties over national boundaries and territories, climate change hysteria and its political gerrymandering, as well as its economic implications, the economy at both the national and international and personal levels, race and gender issues, the use and application of technology, including nuclear technology, the increase in terrorism and rogue nations, global pandemics, and the recent warfare in the re Ukraine, and even more recently in Israel, has prompted yet another round of bold predictions claiming this is that and he is him. We should be confident that every biblical prophecy either has been or will be fulfilled. And it's okay. It's even wise to be intrigued by the notion that we are likely living in the latter days of the last days. And let us not be blissfully ignorant of the current day, nor overly confident that we have everything figured out. We must not be paralyzed with fear amid the constant upheavals of our world, nor should we assume peace, safety, and prosperity will always be our norms. Let us be joyfully confident that our God will bring all things to their appropriate ends, in the appropriate time, in the appropriate way, and that He will deliver His people through every trial 
in tribulation. So if you get lost in the details of the book of Daniel here today, the bottom line is that the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns, and he is the sovereign Lord over all of creation and history. But I'm not going to let you go home just for that. So let's read. Beginning in verse 24, as we think about this godly prophet in the godless world. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Pray with me. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the main issues have been made clear to us, that indeed you rule and reign over the entirety of your creation. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help me today uh, to rightly divide your truth, uh, to speak with confidence and clarity, and yet at the same time to speak with humility. I pray that you would take your word as you have promised and use it in our lives for our good and for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I'll remind you first of all that when you read or think or study prophecy, there are basically three overarching eschatological systems that provide sometimes a helpful lens through which we can view these texts and try to make sense of them. The three types of eschatological systems, and eschatology is only a fancy word for the theology, the doctrine of the last days, or prophecy, okay? And so these positions are known as post-millennialism, amillennialism, and premillennialism, along with kind of a, a unique subset of premillennialism that uh, has been made very popular. It's the, the system that I grew up familiar with. Probably, if you grew up in a Baptist church, uh, you got a steady dose of, of this uh, theology. It would probably be called dispensational, pre-tribulational, premillennialism, uh, and so it's uh, it's a mouthful, but it's the idea of a great distinction between the church of Israel, church and Israel uh, that before an onset of a seven-year tribulation, the church will be taken out, raptured, and then there's an onset of uh, seven years of tribulation. It is popular because, again, I've called out the name of Hal Lindsey, but also it is the system that Billy Graham, Tim LaHaye, John MacArthur, they all embrace this system. Um, it's been popularized. How many of you own a Schofield reference Bible or had one? How many of you had a Ryrie reference Bible? Right, well, Both of them got the inspired and errant footnotes right there in it. Okay, So... Uh, if you're familiar with the, those that attended and graduated, and there are many popular preachers today that are graduates of Dallas Theological Seminary, and it is virtually an essential of the faith to embrace this type of uh, theology. Now, truth and lending here, I am a pre-millennialist, okay? That is my es 
eschatology. I am not a dispensational pre-tribulationist, premillennialist. Okay, uh, I abandoned that uh, many, many years ago. As I've, I've told you many times, uh, having been converted at 15 years old and just reading the Bible. Imagine that you know, that a Christian would read their Bible and trying to make sense of it all and hearing a lot of this, you know, stuff from pulpits and teachers. And I just never could find this rapture thing. I just read and read and read. Never, never found. Now I know where it is now. Okay, it's First, First Thessalonians four and five. I get it. And, I, and if don't don't repeat the era of twenty years ago. You know, Brother Tim doesn't believe in the rapture. I believe in the rapture. It is the timing of the rapture that I have a question about because we will all be gathered with him, to meet him in the air and we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. There is your rapture, okay? So um, so we have these, these three systems. I've kind of told you what um, I think. I think there's some, some strengths and weaknesses of, of all of uh, the systems. But here's the thing. We all agree, whichever system you embrace, that we're anticipating the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to the fact that he will raise the dead and that his kingdom will be perfected and we will enter the eternal state to enjoy him forever. We're fighting about a lot of details that, none, that I, in my opinion, none of us have absolute and perfect clarity in regards to. Now, that's my opinion. I know there are others that speak with far more confidence than I do about those things. And so I do not want to make the mistake of uh, how, how does it go? Uh, uh, I'm not always right, but I'm never in doubt. So, you know, however that, however that goes. So Daniel was written in both Hebrew and Aramaic. That's an interesting phenomenon of the book. First couple of chapters in Aramaic, the, the language of the Babylonian Empire. The middle section from chapter 2, 4 through 7, 28 was written in Hebrew. And the final chapters, 8 until the end of the book in Aramaic. Daniel has been the subject of liberal attacks probably for the last 300 years. Because what you're going to find, at least in my mind, with great clarity is from Daniel's perspective a really precise description of the flow of world history over the next 400 years. And those that want to deny the supernatural character of Scripture, that is, they want to deny that God inspired those who wrote our Scriptures to write exactly what He wanted, and He could reveal to them future events. Well, they want to deny that, and they accused Daniel of being written about 200 B.C., and they call it a prophecy after the fact. Okay, that is, he's writing after all of the events occurred, but writing as though he is predicting them. And I tell you with confidence, the book of Daniel was written somewhere in the mid-500s B.C., and it is predicting the events of the flow of history. Now, quite honestly, um, preaching something such as the book of Daniel is somewhat related to what I've always said. If I step into the pulpit some Sunday morning and say, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, we're going to begin an expositional study verse by verse through the book of Revelation. Please call them in in white coats because I have lost my mind. And so, um, again, it is a part of the Word of God. We should not be afraid of it. But there's things that I just don't have complete certainty and clarity about what this means and what that means. And so it would be very difficult to preach. I've taught it a number of times and will continue uh, to do so. But the interesting thing, and as I've told you, when you preach through books of the Bible, I can't avoid the things I don't like and I can't avoid the things you don't like, okay? Because it's right there in the text. You're going right through it. And you know what? Ezekiel was last week, which made this week what? The book of Daniel. And so we're going to deal with it and deal with it as faithfully uh, as we can. And I will tell you that I don't have it figured out. I kind of had a, an, an analogy come to my mind this week. I saw a picture of Sandy Koufax 
and the late Tom Seaver and the late Bob Gibson, uh, three of the greatest pitchers of, of my lifetime. And they were men, unlike the pitchers of today, that want to come out after five innings and can't pitch with a hangnail or, you know, a sore throat or, you know, a tender elbow or something. Those guys were, give me the ball, and I'll go to the mound with whatever I got on that day, and I'll beat you. And so I'm not going to try to beat you today, but I want the ball. I'll go to the mound, and I'll give you what I've got. And more importantly, I hope what will come through is what God has before us. As I say, I, I don't have everything nailed down to perfection, but I hope that you'll gain an appreciation that we can make sense of some of these things that are indeed uh, difficult uh, to sort out. So I would say to you, uh, don't be paralyzed by the fear of the future. I've mentioned a number of times how popular uh, quote-unquote prophetic preaching was in the 1970s. Uh, if they couldn't scare you about going to hell, they would scare you about being left behind at the rapture. Whatever it took to get you down the aisle to ask Jesus into your heart was whatever the subject of the message needed to be. And so uh, a lot of manipulation uh, related uh, to this. Uh, don't obsess over trying to figure it all out. If you think you've got it all figured out, I promise you, you don't. Okay? I'll just tell you that right off the bat. Uh, so approach this subject with humility. Um, I think you have to embrace one of the systems that I mentioned at some level. Uh, you know, one of the warnings in exegesis class is don't read your theology into your exegesis. Uh, every passage of the Bible is not a proof deck to support your presuppositions, okay? And so, uh, but it does help, but I have found that no system uh, answers every question related to every text. Some of them remain a bit of an enigma. And so I will tell you this, I appreciate the simplicity of the amillennial position. We're just here, and then he comes back, and we're done. And I, I kind of like that, okay? Uh, but it's not my call. I appreciate the gospel optimism of the postmillennial group. I really do. And I, let me tell you this, no matter what your eschatology is, the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the message through which God saves people, and he's still saving people, and he's still changing people, and we should be optimistic about the gospel. And so, um, but again, I find the most agreement with the uh, pre-millennial position. So, at North Clay, we don't say, I just got lucky. We don't say, God told me to tell you. We don't say, well, just ask Jesus into your heart, nor do we wring our hands and hang our heads and say, well, I'm just waiting on the rapture, okay? None of those things wash here, okay? We are the people of God with the message of God that will accomplish its purpose. It always has and it always will until the day of his return. So we affirm God is faithful to himself and his people, he is sovereign over individuals, kings, and kingdoms. All of creation, time, space, history, is moving toward the ultimate goal of glorifying God through preserving and purifying His people, through fulfilling His Word, through conquering, condemning, and at times converting His enemies. Again, to the place in which He will establish and perfect the eternal kingdom of peace and righteousness ruled by his son, Jesus Christ. So, let's look at the book of Daniel, chapter 1. We see in chapter 1 uh, the development of this historical context. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, uh, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of God. What a, a dark, dark opening to a book. That it would seem uh, the city, uh, the king, and even the items associated with worship have, have been taken over 
uh, by a pagan king and utilized in their pagan worship in the house of their pagan gods. And so Daniel was among the first deportees or exiles of the, uh, that preceded the fall of Jerusalem. Most people think this is describing the year 605 B.C. You'll hear me talk a lot about 586 B.C., but usually uh, the commentators say there were essentially three, some even say four, different deportations. The first in 605, the second in 597, and then the final one in 586 B.C., and that is when the uh, temple was raised and destroyed and the city was destroyed, and again, uh, the nation uh, essentially uh, only existed uh, as, as a memory. And so we see uh, here that about 450 years after the coronation of Saul, uh, the kingdom uh, is gone. About 120 years after the fall of the northern kingdom in 722, we see the southern kingdom that did not heed uh, God's warning. And so Daniel is a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and Ezekiel. Uh, Zephaniah wrote a little bit earlier than Daniel. Uh, he, Daniel, interestingly enough, and I, we're not going to explore it, but it's just something to think about. He is one of three prominent Jews who prospered in the courts of the Gentile war, world powers. The others, Joseph and Esther. And so there are kind of some interesting parallels uh, there. Uh, the books of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles uh, tell us about this fall of Jerusalem and the deportation. And then we will be talking about the return both today and in future weeks. That's described in Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Zechariah. In verse 3, we begin to see more of Daniel's situation and uh, the fact that they were outstanding young men that were taken into the, uh, the care of the Babylonian king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, they were going to be treated well. They were going to eat the food uh, that he ate and that Daniel was associated uh, with these three friends. And we see at that point, beginning in verse 8, the discussion of what I call Daniel's courageous faithfulness. Daniel resolved that he was not going to be a party, he was not going to compromise his convictions by eating uh, that which the king offered. And we see all of the, the controversy associated with that, with that. Now, I want to give you just one bit of advice. The purpose of chapter 1, verse 8, through the end of that chapter, is to not give you the details of the Daniel diet, okay? That is not what this is about. It is about a man in a difficult dis, uh, situation that had the courage to not only believe something, but to act on his convictions. Uh, several years ago, I ran across a book by a man named Josh McDowell. Don't inv I don't think he speaks anymore, but if he did, don't invite me to go hear him speak, okay? He is the most shameless self-promoter I've ever heard in my life. But some of his books are okay. And he wrote a book called Beyond Beliefs to Convictions. And that's Daniel. It went beyond belief to action, to conviction, to convictional living. And I believe that is the order of the day uh, for believers in, a, in our time. So he was a man who was holy. He was separated uh, from the world. And along with Joseph, Daniel seems to be really, they seem to be the only two characters in the Old Testament that really escape any criticism of their character uh, and their uh, behavior. Uh, Daniel is listed in Hebrews 11 and in that roll call of faith as a prophet that shut the mouth of lions. So verse 17 of chapter 1 speaks of this wisdom of Daniel that he was going to be well trained in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Again, parallel to Joseph and also uh, to Moses. And then we're told uh, that he uh, was ministering up until the uh, first year of King Cyrus. So Daniel probably lived to be 80 or 90 years old. He was probably born under King Josiah and died somewhere subsequent uh, to King Cyrus, who, again, 
released the Jews back to, to return from exile in 539 B.C. So that's a little bit about Daniel. Well, let's get into chapter 2 and some of the prophecies. Now, I suspect if I were to get, uh, do a show of hands, the, most of you know the, the story of Daniel's three friends in the fiery furnace. Most, yeah, okay, we've heard that one. You know about Daniel and the lion's then? Okay, yeah. And I bet a lot of you, do you know uh, the, the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the statue with the head of gold? That's probably, y'all know about the four beasts, right? So most people are, you know, at least heard some of this stuff tossed around. Well, here we have the first of the visions that God is going to give. Now, he gives this in a dream to the pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, who is entirely perplexed and concerned about what the dream means. And he is prepared uh, to kill all of his advisors and soothsayers and wise men uh, when they can't, first of all, tell him the dream. That's a bit of a rub, isn't it? You know, uh, anybody can kind of spin an interpretation. But first of all, he what? Tell me the dream then tell me what it means. And ultimately, uh, Daniel uh, says, now it's not me, but my God, whom I serve, can reveal these things uh, to, to me. And in the course of this discussion, one of my favorite passages, look at chapter 2, verse 21. A word of praise in regards to our God and Daniel's God, and then verse 21, speaking of God, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Again, God is sovereign over every ruler in our world. Uh, I could not help. Uh, I watched a few minutes of this presidential debate on Thursday night until I got nauseated, and so I went and resolved that and turned it off. Uh, and then I asked Ellen on Friday night, uh, do you want to watch this? And she said, no, but I guess I ought to. And so we did. And what an embarrassment. And the language and the personal attacks and the lack of respect and the lying on both sides and the failure to even answer the, uh, the most basic of questions. And I could be very disturbed and, it, and at times I am. But you know what? Those two men, those two men are under the sovereign authority of God. They are a part of what God is doing to bring all things to their appropriate end in their appropriate time in the appropriate way. And that is a word of comfort to God's people. Okay? However you, whoever you favor or whoever you have disdain for, that is the truth. So, what about this st statue? Well, it's described as having a head of gold. I'll kind of go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. That describes Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon uh, as kind of the, 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 the finest of the ancient ki uh, kingdoms of the ancient world. So going down the trunk of the statue, uh, it is described as having chests of arms and silver, descriptive of the next kingdom that will secede Babylon on the world scene. That is the Medo-Persian uh, kingdom, and it's described as a, in verse 39 as another kingdom inferior to you. The third kingdom is represented by middle, the middle of, of, thighs, of thighs of bronze, which is Greece under the reign of Alexander uh, the Great. And it's the third kingdom that shall rule over the earth. And it's mentioned again in chapter 8 and chapter 11. And then the, the legs and the feet are of iron mixed with clay. And it's descriptive of the empire of Rome and its great strength, yet also uh, its weakness. Maybe even in contrast, its, its vast military might, but also its moral uh, weakness. And so... This says, and he's going to repeat this same message in chapter 7 in this picture of the four beasts. Here's the way the next 400 years is going to play out. These are the kingdoms that are going to rise and fall. That beginning with Babylon, Babylon is going to be defeated by Medo-Persian Empire. And guess what? 
They were. And then they are going to be defeated by the armies of Alexander the Great. And guess what? They were. And Alexander the Great's kingdom is going to be supplanted by, guess who? The Romans. Just as this lays out. So we see that. But here's the, maybe the most important thing about this whole vision and this whole prophecy. Look at chapter 2, verse 44. This is mentioned in the interpretation beginning in verse 31. But what we see is this stone that is cut, but not by the hands of men. And it crushes this great statue. So verse 44, in the days of those kings, the, the kings of the, the toes, uh, s- supposedly, these ten toes, the clay, the, those made up of clay and iron, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all of these kingdoms and bring them to an end. It shall stand forever. The kingdoms of this world, they will, by very definition, they will come and go. But the kingdom that will endure, the kingdom that will exist in ultimate and final victory is the kingdom of God. Just as you saw that a stone cut from a mountain by no human hand, that it broke into pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. The interpretation is sure. And so again, we have the confidence of God's ultimate reign. Now, here's where people would differ. When did the kingdom come? Well, there was certainly an aspect of the kingdom inaugurated in the days of the clay and iron, ten toes, Roman Empire. And that Jesus Christ came, he did his atoning work on the cross, and that kingdom was absolutely inaugurated there. And maybe that's it. We are the great. Listen, you've heard me say it this way. If there were only one Christian, on the face of the earth. And there are all the other kingdoms of the world with all their economic might and all their military might and all of the things that that modern nations have. One Christian left on the face of the earth. The most powerful kingdom on the face of the earth is still the kingdom of God represented in that one Christian. Okay? The kingdom of God was then, is now, always will be the greatest of all kingdoms. Let me tell you something. God exercised a greater power than what is present in our nuclear arsenal to regenerate your dead soul and save you from your sins. So he is the all-powerful one who rules over the all-powerful kingdom. So is that it? Kingdom's here. Kingdom's most powerful. I would say there's something else left. I don't see really the nations of our world broken into pieces and blown away like chaff. I I think there's something even ahead of us. Y'all can argue about it. We can all be wrong, whatever. But there there it is. Okay, so that's the statue. Chapter 3, again, deals uh, with Daniel's three friends in the fiery furnace and their faithfulness there to stand. And again, one of my favorite uh, passages uh, in the book of Daniel, if you look at uh, chapter 3, verse 17, in their statement to Nebuchadnezzar, in the fact that they will not bow down uh, to his image, and upon the threat of throwing them in this fiery furnace, they say, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What a statement. If our God chooses to deliver us out of this deadly peril, if God chooses to deliver us from death and disease and other manner of affliction, so be it. That will be the will of God. But even if he doesn't, we will honor, we will serve, we will glorify 
the God who has saved us, who has promised. He'll be faithful to us to the end. Chapter 4 deals with this very strange account of the insanity of Nebuchadnezzar, also predicted, and a curse brought on him because of his great pride and uh, presumption. Uh, described there in chapter uh, 4, where again he is sent out to live as an animal in the field. Chapter 5, another familiar passage. How many of you have heard the cliche, the phrase, the handwriting on the wall? Well, there it is. There's the handwriting on the wall. That God, and notice what they are doing. Here in this scene described in chapter 5, the pagans of Babylon are utilizing the temples that were dedicated and set, uh, sanctified for service in the temple. They were bringing them in and utilizing them in their vile worship of their gods. And again, God in that moment determined that their time was up, that he was ready to change the times and the seasons. He was ready to raise up a different king. And on that night, upon the appearance of the handwriting on the wall, You've been weighed in the balances, and you've been found wanting. God uses the Medo-Persian Empire under Darius the Mede to conquer the kingdom of Babylon uh, there. And so they uh, are no longer the predominant world power. They are succeeded by that second kingdom, okay? Now, chapter 6, we're going to preserve because... These aren't in chronological order. I've, the way I've outlined it, Daniel in Babylon and Daniel in Persia. So we'll come back to the lines then. Second vision, chapter 7, dealing with the succession of empires. And we see this very infamous vision of four beasts that are devastatingly powerful and one follows the other and we have there in chapter uh, verse 8 of chapter 7 uh, a description related to the ten horns which seems to in some way parallel the ten toes of the statue uh, vision that among the ten horns there are three horns that get supplanted by a little horn and so that's an interesting thing we'll pick up on that again in chapter 8 the concept of a little horn but they're different little horns because the little horn of chapter 7 comes from the fourth kingdom uh, where the little horn of chapter 8 comes from the third kingdom. And so they're different, although their character may be very, very similar. But in the midst of all of this upheaval, all the political shenanigans, and I, I thought James Montgomery Boyce was rather insightful in basically drawing a, a comparison between Romans 13 all authority is given uh, to governments and we should submit to that authority and Revelation 13 and these civil government are ravenous beasts and so I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, concept that uh, yes we're called upon to submit to appropriate authority but we need to understand they are a part of the powers of this world, and indeed, at their core, even the best of them are ravenous, destructive beasts. And so, that is a, a terrible scene, and in the midst of what he's seeing here, and he's terrified by it, he has this great vision, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 7, of one identified as the Ancient of Days, who takes his seat. And then in verse 10, it says, A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and thousands and thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Okay? So Daniel's seen the great vision. Uh, he's seen this final beast representing a, a final, terrific, and terrible kingdom, and again, the, the kingdom of the Roman Empire. Verse 11, it says, I look then because of the sound of the great words of the horn, I mentioned a minute ago, and as I look, the beast was killed, its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire, and for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were pro prolonged for a season 
in a time. That's incredibly enigmatic. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to be something that's actually occurred in the course of history. Of course, the question is, uh, what is the time frame of this business, this interaction or transaction between the Ancient of Days, verses 9 and 10, and the Revelation? Look at verse 13. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Now, there are some that would say that this scene took place at the uh, ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is possible. But a phrase that caught my attention there in verse 10 the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Now that reminds me of the interaction both in Revelation chapter 4 when the scrolls are opened, okay, all right, and all of the, the final chapters of human history are uh, displayed, and also in Revelation uh, chapter 19 when the books are opened, okay? And so this seems to be something at least from my perspective, that is still future, okay, to us. Uh, but again, the upshot is what? However we time frame it, the Son of Man is given ultimate and final dominion. Now, whatever your time frame reference is, whatever you think in terms of has this scene with the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man taken place, or will it take place in the future? Whatever your perspective, I want to be very clear that my conviction is the Lord Jesus rules and reigns as we stand here today. He is in authority. I believe that the future will look quite a bit different when there will no longer, we'll no longer live in the presence of all of the things associated with sin and its curse, Okay? But even sin and the curse is a part of the tapestry that God is weaving, sovereignly weaving, to bring all things to their ultimate end for His glory. The Bible says even the wicked have their purpose being made for the day of trouble. Okay? So, so anyway, there you go. So there's the, the Son of Man. And we see, again, Daniel getting into this business related to that fourth distinctly different kingdom, verse 18 of chapter 7, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Again, we rule and reign with Him forever. And so we can argue about this has been fulfilled and we're ruling and reigning with Him right now, and that's fine if you want to go that right. I would say we're in the process of these things being fulfilled or we're fulfilling these uh, prophecies and they will be perfected, they will be consummated, they'll be perfectly filled in the future. All right, let's move forward into chapter uh, 8. This vision, and it's interesting, I wish we had a lot more time than we've got, but really it deals with the third uh, kingdom that I mentioned. Uh, the demise of the Greek, uh, the, the Greek Empire. And we see a picture of Alexander the Great. I saw a ram charging westward, northward, and southward. No beast could stand before him. There was no one who could rescue from his power. There was no world power like that of Alexander the Great. He conquered the, the entire known world in a span of two to three years. And so he defeated uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. And what we see here is the description that after his death, his kingdom would be divided into four parts. And it absolutely was. Uh, it was divided. T Ptolemy was given the kingdom in Egypt. Seleucus was given the kingdom surrounding Babylon. Uh, uh, Lysimachus was given Thrace in Asia Minor, Minor. And Cassander was given Macedonia and Greece. Kind of the point for our concern 
is that out of this kingdom there shall rise one described as a little horn. That's not the little horn that we mentioned previously because this is associated with the third kingdom, not the fourth kingdom. But this, third, this little horn has a name. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. He came on the scene about 165, 168 B.C., and he oppressed the Jews. He did exactly what is described here. He got defeated in Egypt, and he came back and took his anger out on the Jews in Jerusalem, and he went into the temple, and he offered a pig in the Holy of Holies. And so he desolated uh, that temple in Jerusalem. And so you have that uh, prophesied there uh, here in uh, uh, chapter 8, and it's the, that is returned to. So uh, chapter 8 deals with essentially with a fairly narrow prophecy regarding the demise of the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, I mean, excuse the demise of the Greek Empire after the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, the death of Alexander, and the rise of four kings, and there to be supplanted by this Antiochus Epiphanes. All right, let's go back to chapter 6 very quickly. And I see my time is going quickly. So I'm going to... Notice there, it pleased Darius. So again, it's out of chronological order. This, we're at a time frame of around 539 B.C. This is the Persian king, okay? The prophecies we've been looking at were during the time of the Babylonian regime. Remember, they're supplanted by the Medo-Persian Empire. And so here we have uh, the incidents that will lead to Daniel being placed in the lion's den. Now we move over to chapter 9. We see this beautiful intercessory prayer of Daniel. And, you know, if I really just wanted to get myself off the hook, I'd have probably just preached chapter 9, Daniel's intercessory prayer, and instructed uh, in terms of the beauty and the power uh, and importance of uh, making petition to God and confessing sins and all these things. Uh, but I like to live dangerously, so I did something a little different. So you see that on the heels of that, we see the prophecy that we read related uh, to 70 weeks. Now, that's... 490 years. Some people think it's symbolic. 770s, 710s. I mean, that's that. you could very easily say that's symbolic of just God completing what he's going to do in the course of time. But if you work out the dates, there are some interesting things that come out related to this prophecy, particularly if you begin the date of the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem at the decree uh, in 458 B.C. And if you count forward to 483 years, you come up to about the time of the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are other ways. If you date it from 539, you get a different year. If you date it from 445, you get a different year. There are those that think it should be done according to a lunar cycle year, 360-day years, and I've looked at that. At one time, I kind of embraced that, but I'm, I'm not... I'm not on board with that way of calculating. So I, I honestly think that what is described here is, first of all, in uh, verse 24, that it's the description of the work of Christ. Look there. These weeks are decreed for your people, for your holy city, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. I think that's the work of Christ. I think that's the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, accomplished when he uh, died on the cross uh, for uh, our sins. And, and there's a sense where Daniel is making this great plea for the mercy of God, for the forgiveness of God, and what does God say? This is how it's accomplished in the work of my son. So you see that, and then you see this business about the decree to restore and rebuild, okay? And so uh, you count off the 483 years, as I've mentioned. Uh, you come to the time of the uh, kind of the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that after that ministry, he is cut off, which is the language of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. He's cut off. And so he is cut off, and then what? The uh, 
a people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, of course, that happened. Titus did it. Once again, as Jesus said, there was an abomination of desolation. That was 30-plus uh, years after he said that. And so, um, again, now I don't know about verse 27. I don't know of Titus or any of the Roman emperors making these treaties. And so, again, I think we're looking at something future. There, there will be a final desolator, and he will be the ultimate Antichrist. And he will, I don't, now again, I reject the dispensational notions that he will be dealing with Israel. I think he will make some kind of agreement with the church. And then he will forsake that and he will wreak havoc on the church and upon the world until what? Until he's ultimately destroyed uh, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is chapter 9. We see chapters 10 and 11 and 12. Uh, once again, 10 deals with really what we might call spiritual warfare. Uh, the, these great realities that behind these kingdoms, there are unseen evil beings that are orchestrating and instrumental in the evil of our world. Chapter 11, once again, returns to the business of those uh, second and third kingdoms and their demise. I honestly believe chap the end of chapter 11 begins to once again shift from the discussion of Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 B.C. until a final Antichrist. Uh, I don't think the work and life of Antiochus looks exactly like those final verses. And then again, chapter 12 it deals with God's great and ultimate and final deliverance of uh, his people, and the book honestly closes very enigmatically. Verse 11 of chapter 12, And from the time the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at 1,335 days. But go your way to the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. And so, again, Daniel is disturbed by much of what he learned, but God says, you can rest in me. So, what do we know? Well, one obvious thing, it would be foolish to miss that Daniel is an example of holiness and faithfulness through the power of the resurrected Christ. That is, he lived out, greater is he who is in me than he who is in, within the world. He is a miracle worker, or one for, through whom God worked miracles, who prophesies he's delivered uh, from the lion's den. And so that way he foreshadows Christ. He is God's spokesman, foreshadowing the word incarnate. He is the prophet like, or foreshadows the prophet like unto Moses, the ultimate spokesman of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He prophesies of Jesus as the coming, crucified, coronated, conquering son of man, and Jesus' favorite way of identifying himself is this Son of Man from chapter 7. He promises the success of the work of Christ and his ultimate lordship over all creation. Daniel describes the realities of God's sovereign rule over all of creation. He rules over the affairs of men, over the entirety of the created order. He is sovereign over the unseen spiritual realms. God has designed history for the purpose of glorifying its creator, redeemer, and sustainer, the Lord Jesus Christ. The flow of time, the rise of kings and kingdoms, even the seasons and the weather are proceeding towards the time of consummation when all of creation celebrates its release from bondage and confesses that Jesus is indeed Lord of all. We live in eager expectation that God's purpose for a redeemed people who live in a restored creation in the fullest enjoyment of a resurrected Savior whose name is Jesus is a certain promise because it is a promise made by the one who is internally faithful to himself, his purpose, and his people. Let's pray. Father, once again, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a word that tells us that all of history serves 
to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. May we live in the confidence, in the confidence that you are working all things according to your will. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.